In this video, we're going to be sketching in real time a world famous landmark and seeing how building up those simple lines, simple textures, really loose, light and lovely colours can create an image which is really fun to create and really pleasing to look at at the end as well. The reference I'm using is linked down below and the colours and all my materials that I'm using are also linked down below. If you check out the supplies link in the description, these colours are in particular, they're handmade colours um, by uh, Addy from Addy's Artlets. Um, she's given them to me for free and I'm just having a play with them. She's not asked me to do any videos with them, just asked me to do a couple of Instagram posts um, and give her some feedback. But I thought, let's do some videos let's really see what handmade colors are about so you can check out some other videos about them we'll also link down below um and without further ado i guess let's start talking about the actual sketching process we're doing today so we are of course sketching stonehenge so i guess it's sort of like urban sketching isn't it this is a a man-made object in the very much the earliest sense of the idea and we've got these large stones these big stones and they are forming our simple shapes so as normal for me i'm going to mostly approach this as a continuous line and that's because that's just how i like sketching and i think it adds a bit of interest a bit of fun a bit of texture there's no reason that you have to do it this way but the idea is of finding these simple shapes so simple rectangles breaking down that rectangle into triangles and squares of light and dark for example that's what i'm trying to achieve and i think that's a sort of really good way of approaching any form of art finding shapes breaking those shapes down and finding the structure within i'm taking a slightly zoomed in view of this scene so you can see that um for example i haven't got all the foreground in and I'm going to just use that right hand uh, boulder, the right hand sort of monolith. That's just going to frame my scene. I'm going to have a nice bit of space on either side rather than trying to fill the whole page. I think that's a great tip as well for, for sketching in general. We don't need to fill the whole page. Often placing a scene within our page can make our scene more dramatic, more quickly and more easily. And also for watercolours, it can be tempting to try and fill absolutely everything. And there's no reason you can't do that, but we need to be aware of the pros and cons. If we're going to fill our whole scene with watercolours, we're going to have to spend an awfully long time layering those colours to get really nice contrast and depth to them. If we leave lots of space, lots of place empty, then our line work can do all the talking and our colours can enhance that line work. And just by approaching this scene with simple shapes and a simple sort of inquisitive mind about what's going on, we kind of captured it already. We've got those key parts of the scene. Now what I'm doing is simple linear hatching, all in one direction um, uh, for each sort of direction to imply a different plane or a different place. So I've swapped the hatching to a perpendicular direction here to show that we're talking about a different stone in a different plane. And again, swapping the hatching back to the original direction to show this kind of original plane. It's now the plane facing us rather than facing away. And just by using really simple hatching like that, you can start picking about light and dark. Now, that is partly what I'm trying to do here. Partly pick out those darkest bits with hatching and even cross hatching. So cross hatching being where we don't just go in one direction, we go in two, three or four directions to build up that value, make it darker and darker. I'm partly also going to be trying to explain the scene in different ways. So trying to pick apart planes. So a plane is uh, a sort of direction of travel of a surface. So if we have a cube, it's got four sides um, on the sort of horizontal axis and it's got a top and a bottom. So six sides in total. And each of those sides is on a different plane. So by hatching them differently, you can immediately show the viewer that each side is facing a different way. They're not just some, some weird sort of visual distortion. It gives you an idea quickly if something is 2D, 3D. And that's the two things I like to use my hatching for in, in this phase of the drawing. Explaining the image in the sense of light and dark and the sense of 
different planes in different places. This little bit of hatching is a nice example. As soon as we add that hatching, you notice how that object, that monolith, becomes two-sided. Before that, it's just one big shape with a line going down the middle of it. Not fully explained, doesn't really explain too much at all, in fact. Just a simple bit of hatching, and suddenly it's explained. Hopefully you can see the same happening here. As soon as I divide up this, this monolith, it doesn't make much sense, but as soon as I add that hatching to that division, ah, look, it's a 3D object. So that's that's what I'm trying to get, that's what I'm trying to grasp with this. Here I'm just drawing in the horizon line. So the horizon line is, um, you know, the distance, you know, landscape like this where it's flat, it's just the distant point where you can see the horizon line. Um, and by getting that across our page, it makes everything stop floating. And if you don't have that horizon line in, in a landscape, um, you might find that your scene is floating. It doesn't really understand where it sits on the page. And with that, we're ready to move on to just really loose colors. So I'm using a quill brush. Um, it's like a, a mop or a quill brush, uh, depending on the exact shape and, you know, just the terminology the company that produces it wants to wants to use, really. And with this, I'm adding some essential blue and some teal. So it's a bit like a primary blue, a cobalt, an ultramarine blue, and a teal blue. And I started with splashing the colour on, because if I do that, I can come and connect those splashes with water. And it's a nice way to get a fluid, interesting, slightly random texture in the sky without overdoing it, without adding too much pigment to the page too quickly. I'm using this kind of tealy blue initially to suggest some of the more shadowy areas. Um, because these colours are so loose, because they're so light, there isn't much difference in value. And we're not trying to get a huge difference in value yet. Some of these little touches of colour into this watery sky will get us a slightly higher value in places. Um, but they're also just getting us a difference in texture. Here, a bit more specific painting with less water on a drier page and you see how that teal does produce a fairly convincing shadow but still all these colors will try lighter so this is why we always paint in more than one face so here we're doing loose colors and we're going to have to come back and add something extra something more now i'm wanting some greens in this there isn't a huge sense of green in the reference actually there are some greens but it's more about blues neutrals and some of that yellowy redness coming through from the sun. But we can exaggerate and change bits that we want to exaggerate and change. So I'm mixing up a couple of greens. This limited palette, there's only seven colours, and there's three of them are blue and one of them's teal, which is another kind of blue. And they're all quite muted. Um, and we only have one sort of very warm yellow. So the greens I'm able to mix aren't hugely varied, but they all have that kind of shadowy mood to them, all that sunsetty glow that you can kind of feel just from that neat yellow. That that neat yellow is um, Fresh Alfonso is the name of the colour, a bit like a Hansa Yellow Deep. And what I'm doing is keeping that page wet, moving around, seeing where a little bit of extra colour, a little bit of extra something might be needed. As the page gradually sort of dries and as the colours move and settle, because of the amount of water it takes a while for them to move and settle, you can start seeing you know, where do things look a bit flat? Now, sometimes I would be tempted at this point in the painting to just stop and let it dry. But there's a couple of interesting things I wanted to try. So we have this, this sunset. You can see I've moved the sunset to a different part of my painting. So the sunset's actually in the most right-hand gap between monoliths in the reference. But to fit my composition, I've moved it over one gap. Um, and I wanted to get that real sense of this sun like spewing out, sort of producing that lens glare in between. Or for me, I wear glasses. So although you well-sighted people might never get this effect in real life, this is normal for me. I, I get these glare effects looking through my glasses. I really wanted to, to get that feel. And to get that, I was aware, well, we need to start it while the page is wet. So painting with these kind of wet on wet approaches is a really lovely way to start getting those more abstract feeling things, which are nonetheless quite real. Having put all that sort of colour down, we because it's wet, we can really actually lift very effectively. So notice just how light that area I lifted out has become. 
just with a simple touch of a piece of tissue. Um, so that is another reason I like painting Flexby. I like working quite a long time in this first wet on wet phase because actually it's the time where we can make mistakes and we can lift them up. We can make mistakes and we can adapt to them. Here I just thought how can I make this foreground more interesting? Um, and I'm trying to add in more and more exciting depth of value, depth of colour. And I started to worry a bit, I've got to say. And you might get the same feel here that it looks a bit messy, doesn't it? And all of these colours are a little bit granular. They've got an, a lovely texture, but they're all, all got texture. And that's kind of making this feel a bit scary, a bit hard to interpret. So I'm moving away. I don't want to do too much extra in that sunsetty area. And I moved away, started adding some some purple shadows, a bit more blue. That blue is hoping to push away some of these um, ready yellow colours, but also just to remove my mind from that area. So I'm not focusing on it. I'm not getting too distressed by it. One of the things we really have to be aware of in watercolours, as I said at the beginning, is everything will dry a lot paler and look a lot calmer. And one of the biggest risks would be that I panic here and I go, oh, I need to keep working this. I need, this needs to look good now. Whereas actually, sometimes you just need to go, I've done enough. And if I leave it, it will probably look all right. And then I'll be able to make it look great later. But if I keep going and going, it's just going to turn into brown, muddy mush and I'll, I'll just regret it. So that's why I've moved away and why I agree. It looks a bit scary at the moment. It looks very scary at the moment. It looks like there's absolutely no way that we can actually come back and save this. Having had a bit of time away, I thought, you know what, I can probably come in here, not with more paint, but with more water. So I'm coming in with a clean brush. And what I'm trying to do is just lift away some of that paint. And you can see we're getting that lifting out that white returning to the page that's going to create some little edges so i'm just trying to soften those edges and again a tiny bit more paint is that a good idea is it not well we'll find out but i just wanted to uh, reinvigorate in a couple of places now that i'm feeling brave now that that lifting has worked quite well interestingly you can probably see that that extra bit of color has made it quite murky again so again i've gone back to oh no <laughs> have i ruined it <laughs> Um, and the last bits I wanted to do were again just to amp up the contrast. And it, uh, that's another way of distracting from excessive textures by adding an extra bit of contrast. Um, the thing is, you might have seen the the painting at the beginning. I actually really liked how this came out, and you'll see as we continue to paint and as we continue to adapt what goes on on this page, that you know, by stepping away, by giving yourself a bit of freedom and by understanding the processes and how your watercolours work, or in case how these watercolours work, because all watercolours are going to be a bit different. Um, actually, you can create really lovely art, which feels a bit manic at the beginning, but you understand what's going to happen and you give yourself the time and the space for it to just work itself out. Just to add something extra, I've decided to be quite gentle here so found a nice gentle neutral in my palette this is no specific mix but when you have a big palette out like this you can literally just look and go right there right there in my palette things have become quite neutral and i thought by just toning down a little bit of extra neutral gray that will hopefully also help to sort of balance out all that chaos few little bit more touches, tiny bit more lifting, tiny bit more clean Alfonso yellow. So really going for bolder, less scrubby colours. And now it's really important to step away and let it dry. And just like that, look at the difference. So this is where I've been saying, oh, it looks so chaotic. There's so much going on. But actually, that's often because things haven't settled. They haven't softened yet. As things dry and with that much water, it did take a good 20, 30 minutes to dry. As things dry, they will just sort of flatten. And actually what's happened is instead of being really muddy, instead of having really damaged paper, because I kept working it and working it, I stopped at about the right time. And we've got actually a fairly neutral background. And what will tend to happen, if you mix loads and loads of colours, people often think that they form mud, but they don't necessarily. Um, there's an artist called Graham Booth, very uh, really brilliant sort of classic watercolour artist, and um, 
he talks about how actually you know and if you mix all your colors together you tend to get gray and my observation is if i mix all my colors i tend to get gray what happens to make mud is you put too much pigment on the page so it's not the mixing it's the fact that you've mixed and mixed and mixed you've got tons and tons and tons of pigment on the page you damage your paper underneath which means that that paper absorbs the pigment creates these opacities as long as you've mixed all your colors but kept them light and loose actually loads of pigments will just probably form a bit of a neutral the other reason that you might get mud on the page is if you're using lower quality pigments they often have brighteners in or they have things to um, make the colors appear lighter and more saturated um, and as you put more and more of that on the page that makes things opaque um, so you end up with mud you end up with stuff which doesn't feel great but being light and loose you'll normally end up like this with just something a little more neutral than you expected all i'm doing with my pen now is providing a little bit of structure so all that loose color is kind of it feels like you could remove those stones the monoliths and you just see the sky and you're kind of seeing the sky through the monolith so that's the effect i wanted with that glare of the sun but I also want the monoliths to be there. So I want the shadowed side to be there. And so I'm just making sure that we're aware of their shape and their structure. And then we can come back in with a little bit more tone, texture, a little bit more watercolor, something else to um, make the monolith stones feel more real, but on a clear structure and with a really lovely transparent background. And this is now what we're gonna do. So we're coming back, I've got uh, a flat brush again um, and I'm just going to do some gentle layering so here I'm aiming to just uh, pop down sort of little squares of color in a kind of painterly way at the moment we've got a very water like tra not traditional I suppose but very transparent and loose watercolor in the background and it's got no edges it's all soft um, but I want to add a sense of the painting technique in the front so I'm adding lines, I'm adding squares where you can see the process which has gone into the painting and it's an opportunity therefore to add some really bold and bright colours or some really deep and dark colours and also to layer and glaze and mix in in that sense of mixing so we're not mixing the pigments we're mixing the layers so you pop down some red on top of a darker area you'll get a darker red than if you pop down the red on a light area for example and then just to make things feel again a bit more real so we we want a little bit more sort of body to this background well we need to increase some of the value in it so i'm adding a mix of some teal and some vintage blue which is a bit like an indigo and by increasing the value around these stones again these stones start to feel a bit more real and this is all just through simple little squares of paint that's all i'm adding just a few little squares of paint this is a technique if you watch a lot of my videos you'll have seen me do a few times um but not a huge amount and it's something i really enjoy um but it's hard to uh teach i guess it's harder to teach harder to show um, and it's perhaps something i'm less confident about so you hopefully as i'm gaining confidence with it you'll see me using this idea more and more as i'm able to express why i'm doing things and therefore i i really sort of want to show you things that i can explain why i why I do them because if I can't explain why I do them or if I'm not confident in why I'm doing them then I don't want to lead you down as we say uh, down the garden path I don't want to um, send you the wrong way or give you ideas which uh, are ill-founded or at least you know my ideas might be uh, wrong for many people but for me they're things which work and I'm certain about and I'm getting more and more certain with this idea I'm actually getting a lot of certainty from it from um, sketching with Colin a lot um, and Colin brilliant artist he does this kind of layering effect uses a lot of um, specific colors and square brush and I'm kind of looking at ways I can incorporate that so what you might notice as I was talking about at the beginning that background layer really loose really flowy definitely always what I love doing this foreground layer more specific and gradually we've built up the feel of the scene and just like that we're pretty much done so if you've enjoyed that do like subscribe leave a comment what do you think about this kind of layered approach and how do you find approaching 
interesting scenes like this. Want to find out more, then join me on sketchloose.co.uk. So thank you everyone for watching my little sketching videos. If you enjoy my content, please do subscribe to my channel because it makes me really, really happy. Thanks again.